I don't have millions of peaches. I've got a couple of hundred. And they definitely weren't put into a can. I guess I bet the man to it because I'm gonna put them into a bottle. We're making peach brandy, baby. Did you think I was not gonna make the reference? <laughs> How's it going Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse and this is Still It and uh, I am definitely having a kick-ass week because I've been wanting to make peach brandy for a long, long, long time. Now, uh, I just want to point out team that some of these peaches don't look so great. They've got blemishes on the skin, so on and so forth. Couldn't really care what they look like. I care what they taste like and what they smell like. And these are really, really nice. I guess it's the right time of year in New Zealand. I don't know these things. I just know that they're delicious uh, and I want to make brandy out of them. So let's take these boxes inside. I'm going to be processing this stuff by hand, so uh, I want a nice cutting board and a nice knife and a nice surface. Let's get stuck in. First up, I made sure to give the peaches a really good wash just to make sure there was nothing sticking to the outside of them. Get rid of any spray that happened to be on there. And of course, remove any of the stems. I went through each and every peach like this before dicing them up with a knife. Ah, so that took about two hours of straight cutting um, to get this sorted. You're probably asking yourself, why on earth am I doing this much? And why on earth did I do it this way? Number one, forgot that our food processor was out of action, so that wasn't an option. Uh, number two, I kind of romanticized the idea of just doing it all by hand. Obviously, there's other ways of doing this. If you want to do that, uh, that's fine. <laughs> and number three, you can, you know, there are a lot of peaches out there that will let you just break them open and pull the stone out when they're at the right ripeness. These are not one of them. It just it doesn't work with these. They go from being hard um, to basically going rotten. You know what's kind of crazy though, is this is every single stone. It's all of them. Whoops. Well, minus one now. <laughs> uh, but from the whole lot, whereas I got uh, four and a half of these buckets or pots worth of flesh, uh, the rest is already in the fermenter. Do you know what else is crazy though? And this, the supposed information age, I can go online and get information on how to make peach brandy from the other side of the world. When I look for that information, the information isn't given to me really based on what I'm actually looking for. It's made better for me by someone else or a robot based on information that robot has about me, like my location, for example. Today's sponsor has something to say about that, NordVPN. What does a VPN actually do? In a nutshell, it takes your data, encrypts it, and sends it through a network of their servers. When the data finally reaches its intended destination, it looks like it came from an IP address based in the country that you decide on, instead of the IP address of your device. Why would you care about any of this? NordVPN hides your internet activity from your own ISP through encryption. Yeah, your internet service provider knows what you're doing. Not anymore with NordVPN. But for me, the best part is it opens up access to content that you could otherwise not access. Changing political or legal winds can lead to certain sites or services being outright blocked in your region. NordVPN lets you get right around that. Perhaps you just want access to the UK's Netflix library, or America's Netflix library, or New Zealand. Yeah. You don't want access to New Zealand's Netflix library. So take control of your internet experience today with NordVPN. Visit nordvpn.com slash stillit to get a huge discount on a two year plan and use the code stillit to get another month for free. The best part is they offer a 30 day money back guarantee. Hmm, yum. Anyway, thanks NordVPN. Shall we, uh, shall we get back to making this peach brandy guys? With all the peaches in the fermenter, I could top it up with water, just enough to barely cover the peaches. And next, I added some pectic enzymes just to help thin things out and break it down a little. And of course, the trusty paint mixer mixed it up entirely. It's the next morning and after the enzymes have had a bit of time to do their job and loosen things up a bit, and a little bit more uh, food processing with the old paint mixer, the wash slop. <laughs> now it looks like this. So it is fairly thick still. I used a filter just to get out enough clear liquid to get a reading with a hydrometer and we're currently sitting at uh, 1036. 
Uh, that is a little bit lower than I was hoping for, possibly due to the fact that some of the peaches weren't entirely ripe enough. Oh, quick pro tip guys, uh, what you can do if you're having this trouble where you don't have enough peaches uh, right now that are 100% ripe, is what you do is you, you collect the ones that are ripe, you process them and you freeze them, and then you collect more that are ripe, you process them and freeze them, uh, and then once you have enough processed and frozen, you can pull them all out and make the mash. Uh, I didn't do that, obviously. <laughs> anyway, it could have been because of that. It could have been because I added a little bit too much water. I was hoping for more like 1040, 1045, uh, but we're sitting at 1030, uh, what did I say, 1036. When this ferments out, it's probably gonna be about 4%, 4.5%, just a little bit low. So I'm gonna do something underhanded, dastardly, unspeakable even. I'm going to take the walk of shame over here and the walk of shame back. <laughs> I gotta put some sugar in. Oh, I really didn't want to do this, but I wanted to keep it pure. <laughs> but it is what it is. I'm gonna bump the gravity up to 1065 with the sugar, which will mean that I'm getting roughly half the fermentables from the peaches and half fermentables from sugar. Like I said, I'd, I feel disgusting doing this, but I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> if you're in a similar situation and you're trying to figure out how to calculate something like this, you can go to the Chase the Craft website and there is a sugar wash calculator here. The cool thing is with sugar is that it's um, it's kind of linear or additive. So if you want to get to 1.07 and you have 1.035, then 0.35 plus 0.35 equals 0.7, uh, you need to get 0.35 into the wash and the, that calculator will let you do that with volume and the amount of sugar you add. Pretty easy. Let's talk yeast, shall we? So I had lots of options on uh, yeast I could use for this, obviously. But I did get some recommendations from two people that I respect. Uh, number one is a local guy called Graham, who to be honest helped me out with a whole lot of this and kind of gave me the uh, the basic roadmap slash inspiration to just get in and get this damn thing done. Thank you, dude. Uh, he suggested this stuff. And also, Bearded and Bored suggested this stuff. You don't know who Bearded and Bored is? Sort your shit out. Check his videos out up here. Both of them recommended this yeast. And I've been wanting to use it for some time. People talk about it. Uh, in a way where it's, it's almost got like this magical property to bring out the flavor of the fruit. I don't know if I believe that. I've never tried it, so I can't say for sure. But I think probably more what it does do is produce esters that augment the flavors of fruit. And it is touted to create esters on the floral, fruity side of things, especially when you ferment it at a slightly lower temperature. So that's why I'm using Lalamond K1V116. Man, mouthful. Anyway, this has been hydrating for the last uh, 35 minutes. It's an easier way to wake the yeast up rather than dumping it straight on into the crazy environment full of sugar with a lot of pressure on the, uh, the yeast cell walls. So, to be honest, there's not a lot left to do other than, where's my drill? Where's my drill? Ah. <laughs> Give it another blitz with this to get as much oxygen into the wort as we can. Uh, Pitch this in, give it a gentle stir, cap it up, and wait. This took a little bit longer to ferment out than most of my projects do. Uh, it's almost three weeks to the day now, but it has fermented out dry. It's down to uh, a gravity of one, which is great. The next step that we need to do is to separate the chunky stuff in here, in the fermenter, from the liquid, assuming that you don't have the ability to distill you know, on fruit or on grain. There's a couple of different ways to do this and it doesn't have to be overly complicated. Uh, for example, you could literally use one of these guys. It's gonna take you a few batches, but you'd get there. Uh, another pretty accessible option for home brewers, home distillers, are uh, these grain bags. You can get them from almost any, you know, home brewing home distilling supply store uh, if you are in america and you want to know where to get one i'll put a link to adventures and home brewing down below great service i love your work guys uh, but today seeing as i've got the equipment i'm going to be using this which is um, the brewing kettle from claw hammer supplies uh, and it is literally just uh, an oversized sieve <laughs> Thank you. 
In case you don't know, the reason we're separating the chunky stuff from the liquid stuff is because in small stills that home distillers often have access to, they tend to scorch, which means anything chunky in the still will burn to the bottom of the pot, just like when you're making a stew or a soup, and uh, it'll kind of ruin things. But when products like these are made traditionally, like rakia, for example, uh, more often than not, it's desirable to actually distill on the fruit, on the chunky stuff. There's flavor in there and you want it, you know, in your final product. Don't get me wrong, team. If you don't have the ability to distill on the chunky stuff, this is still worth doing. It's still very much worth doing. But for those of you that are distilling with something similar to a T500, I got a little secret weapon that might help you out. This is a pot. Cool, eh? <laughs> ah, but the pot has legs. Let me explain before you think I've gone completely crazy. It's a really, really simple concept. We're happy with clear liquid in the T500, so we fill the T500 up, about half full, with a whole lot of relatively clear liquid. This thing can then go inside the pot. The whole thing goes inside, the legs keep it up way above the bottom of the pot, uh, and we put the sloppy stuff inside the pot with legs. In other words, the T500 is kind of acting like its own jacketed still. The clear liquid heats up, it heats the whole chamber, the soup, the goopy stuff heats up, and that can distill as well, and it isn't gonna burn. Just remember guys, if you are gonna build something like this, make sure you're using legit materials. Uh, I would stick to 100% stainless for everything. Don't use zinc, don't use galvanized. You guys know the drill. So with the filtered liquid and optionally the, the chunky stuff in there as well, if you're doing that, uh, it is time to move on to our stripping runs. And the stripping runs serve one main purpose if you're not sure what they are, uh, and that is basically just to cut the volume down. So what we're gonna do is a series of stripping runs. Wash comes out of the fermenter, goes into the still. We run it pretty hard and fast, and all we're doing is cutting down on volume. And then we collect everything that comes off the still, that two or three times we run it, we put it back into the still, and that will be the spirit run that we're gonna do later on. Yes, this is a T500 still, and yes, it is normally set up and used uh, as a full reflux still to create really high ABV, basically vodka. But uh, in this situation, what we've done is we've disconnected the reflux condenser and we're only using the product condenser. If that makes no sense to you whatsoever, that's cool. Don't stress about it. There's a video up here you can check out that'll uh, sort you out and let you know exactly what I'm talking about. Basically, the long and short of it is that we've taken this reflux still and we've turned it into a pot still. Anyway, I figure I've got a solid few hours of stripping runs ahead of me. So let me get these out of the way and I'll check back in with you before the spirit run. It ended up taking three stripping runs to get through all of that peach wash. Uh, took some time, so now it's the next day. But what I have now is uh, approximately 10 liters, I haven't exactly measured it, of low wines. Once again, low wines are all the stuff that's collected from the stripping runs uh, at 40% ABV, pretty much exactly. So that can go on into the pot now and we can get started on the spirit run, which is exciting. Back at the still, the things are all heated up and we have action, we're running. Now, for those of you that are new to this, this first initial part that comes off the still, we don't want to keep it. It's nasty, you don't want to drink it, it's not enjoyable. <laughs> it's not going to be enjoyable today while you drink it and it's definitely not going to be enjoyable tomorrow uh, when you wake up. So, uh, the idea here is that we're going to take what we call the four shots and basically just discard them. You don't have to discard them, use them for window cleaner or fire lighter or whatever you want, but we're getting them out of the way. Uh, so I'm getting to 100 mils now, that's what I'm going to take for this batch. But now that we've collected the four shots, uh, I'm actually going to switch over to collecting what we call heads. Now the heads, we're once again, we're not going to drink right now, but the thing is I'm going to collect into multiple little jars like this. So when I've got some time and I can stand over at the bench later on, I can assess the cuts and decide exactly where I'm going to make these, you know, cuts between heads and hearts and hearts and tails. By the way, I'm running the still exactly the same as we did for the stripping run, with one exception. So there is still no water going to the reflux condenser. The water is only going to the product condenser. We're running it pretty much as a pot still. 
The only difference is now I'm running the power through my voltage regulator. So what I'm doing is essentially limiting the T500 to having roughly half of the power it normally has going into the pot. Uh, and I'm just doing that to, to limit the vapor speed, limit the speed of distillation, create a slightly more delicate and, and refined product. Uh, during the course of the run, as the percentage alcohol that's left in the pot drops, Yes, I am going to have to bump that temperature up a little bit to keep the same speed of offtake over at the cuts jar. Here we are on the bench, guys. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've done most of the donkey work so you don't have to sit through it all. Uh, but as a summary, uh, heads up top, they heads, I mean, nasty stuff. You don't really want it. <laughs> The thing that was interesting to me is that I was expecting to be fighting uh, between how much heads do I keep versus how much peach flavor do I keep in here. Uh, and right at the turn, which is sort of these three glasses here, from heads into hearts, honestly, there's not a whole lot of peach flavor sitting here. Going through the actual hearts themselves kind of made me, <laughs> I, I don't know why I haven't learned this already. It happens to me so often. But I've learned that when I think of peach, what I think of, the flavor I think of is this kind of thing, peach extract. And it is that one dimensional, juicy peach flesh flavor. And there's not a lot to it. But when you actually eat a peach, that's not the case. You get that weird fluffy peach skin thing. You get the kind of the bitterness and the astringency from the skin, but also this crazy like flavor boost that's in the skin as well. All of these things get crammed in together to give you the experience of eating a peach, and it is so much more than just peach extract. And the funny thing is, I've kind of got a spectrum of it <laughs> running <laughs> through here. It's really quite interesting, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, anyway, when I got down to tails, oh, sorry, you might be wondering too why this jar is, um, empty? Was it because I tasted something nasty? I just knocked the jar over like an ass. <laughs> anyway, down here in the tails, um, honestly these sort of snuck up and surprised me. I didn't really taste much of anything when I was running the still uh, until I started noticing something a little bit odd happening in this jar uh, and then suddenly the next jar was cloudy. Anyway, so I've got two blends. Uh, one is literally a little bit of everything from here through to uh, here, I just went big with it. Uh, that was the first thing I did, just to see what happened. A little tincture, once again, it's in that video. Smells great, smells like fresh peach, which is amazing. I didn't think this would smell like peach. The problem is, on the tongue, it's just not quite right. There's something weird about it. It is almost like um, barrel spice from a whiskey, and that doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't sit right at all. Uh, and when I first tasted that, I'll be honest, I freaked out a little bit until I thought about it a little bit further and I realized that it's not actually spice, it's tannin and astringency. I realized that, I went back and did a, another blend and dropped both of these glasses out and went just from here through to here. It leans slightly more towards that sort of more typical juicy peach flavor, which is fine. And on the tongue, it takes you through the whole sort of spectrum of peach, but it doesn't quite get to that crazy grungy like barrel pepper whiskey sort of side of things. So I'm happy, which means I'm gonna blend all of these things into here. And then we can get an exact ABV, proof it down. But there's one last thing I wanna try uh, before I call this quits, and that is whether a very, very, very small amount of this is gonna make it better or ruin it. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Come on. No, I don't enjoy it. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it as is. So that is 76% and we have, I just finished measuring this out, 2.6 liters, which means I need to proof it down with, hold on, come on phone, uh, 1.73 liters of water to get 45%. It is quite like, heavy and grungy uh, and I think maybe using like one plate maybe two plates on the spirit run would have been good but I didn't want to do that I, I wanted to keep it with the T500 as well that's something else you get to experiment with uh, if you have the equipment and anyway team I hope you enjoyed the video if you did you know do the YouTube things like subscribe so on and so forth and I'll catch you next time keep on chasing the craft see ya